G'day, Richard Harris. I'm back in the shed and today we're going to talk about the controversial topic of helmets. To wear them or not. Hi, thanks for joining me again. So we're going to talk about helmets and uh, in the context primarily of cave diving, but uh, there's a lot of technical divers who wouldn't be seen without one and there's a lot who wouldn't wear one if it was the last hat on earth. And why is it controversial? So uh, cave divers, particularly from the British sort of side of the cave diving uh, fence, I guess, will, uh, will swear by helmets. It's obviously a great place to mount all sorts of stuff. Uh, lights on the side, just a bit of bungee, bungee cord, uh, uh, a primary light on the, on the front or a GoPro camera, either on the front or the top or the sides. And um, if you're doing stuff like surveying, if you're uh, doing photography and just want a little bit of ambient light from a very soft uh, caving light on the front of the helmet, it can help you check and uh, see the settings on your camera housing. So there's a lot of uh, reasons that make helmets very convenient, not the least of which, of course, is to protect the old noggin if you're scootering. And I've certainly had plenty of bumps on the head when I've been scootering in caves and been very grateful for wearing a helmet. So what about the downsides? Well, I guess one of the primary reasons that people object to the use of helmets is that because it can make uh, the use of their diving equipment either uh, more complex or potentially less safe. For example, people who have a long hose around their neck, in the event that you might need to deploy it, it might uh, get entangled in the helmet and make that maneuver less uh, swift and efficient. Um, <coughs> I got, I've certainly heard the argument that if you need a helmet to protect your head while you're scootering, then you really are not very good at scootering. And that's a fair point, but means <laughs> I definitely need to work on my scootering proficiency because in low flat cave, it, I find it very easy to get distracted and have a bit of a, a head strike on the on the top of the cave. Now it's not good for the cave, but it certainly hurts your head if if uh, if you're not paying attention. So uh, the other thing I've seen people do with their helmets is to have a, a C-shaped clamp or bracket on the side of the helmet, and they put their primary light up there if they're doing some surveying or if they're doing something more complex with their hands. Uh, people who w would argue, of course, that you should be able to do that with your hands, even with a primary light on the back of your, your left hand, but um, some people find it easier just to quickly snap it into that uh, position in your helmet. So um, look, there's di so many different ways of doing these things in technical diving, and that's what keeps it interesting. And I know there's a lot of robust discussions can potentially uh, follow these ki kinds of, um, you know, uh, what seem like very small things can create a, a very big storm. But my advice is, if you, if you think a helmet might suit you, give it a try, see what other people are doing, and see if it suits your style of diving. Certainly if you're in, uh, in sumps with limited visibility, you know, a big, powerful primary light actually uh, serves very little advantage. And, and small lights on your helmet can actually be quite an efficient way to dive. And it's just another place to put your backup lights. Now, in, um, in talking about helmets, you know, what sort of stuff is available? And those of us who do both ca dry caving and uh, cave diving in the same trip can find that, um, you know, a helmet is essential because, uh, you know, you shouldn't be in a dry cave without a helmet. And if you can transition from uh, dry cave to sump and then into the next passage of dry cave, then obviously it's easiest if you can just keep the helmet on and you can have a helmet that does both of those things efficiently. But of course, underwater we're often or usually wearing a hood, which means that some styles of dry ca caving helmet don't really work underwater uh, because of the extra bulk on your head. And the other thing is some climbing and caving helmets have a lot of foam uh, for the protection of your of your skull and your brains and so they don't work particularly well in the cave environment if they've got a lot of flotation in them. So there's a few different styles of helmet and I've got a few of them and I thought I'd just show you a couple of different ones and some of the pros and cons. Now one of the one of the absolute chestnuts in terms of uh, helmets that that seem to work quite well across uh, both disciplines caving and and cave diving is the old Petzl Ekron Rock, and they're not made anymore, which is sad because they were a fantastic helmet. 
They uh, sit a little bit high on your head when you've got a when you've got a hood on, but they're incredibly comfortable inside the cave. They've got the traditional, you know, climbing and caving. Um, uh, what's it called a harness I suppose for you which is adjustable for your head and they're very comfortable to walk around uh, outside of the water um, and um, it does seem to expand and uh, accept my head with a hood on it although as I say it does, does sit up just a, a little bit higher than I would like um, you'll find a lot of cave divers drill extra holes into helmets and you know potentially that can affect their their safety and their integrity but um, a couple of well-placed holes to put bungee cord and stuff to put uh, lights into seems to work pretty well um, so that's the Ekron rock if you can find one second hand on eBay it makes a, a really good caving and cave diving helmet um, my first my first helmet for caving and climbing uh, was the Petzl um, which what model was this Spilio maybe um, which is uh, sorry Elios Elios um, it says only for climbing made in France uh, that's got a really nice harness inside it but you can see it's got a lot of uh, hard foam inside it so I found this uh, not very good for cave diving for a couple of reasons firstly it sits really high on your head with a uh, with a hood on and um, you know that that foam flotation uh, is probably not ideal for, for cave diving but for caving itself, I really like it. It's really lightweight and um, works uh, works very well for me in that regard. But I don't use it when I'm doing both. Now, traditionally, uh, divers who are just diving and not caving will use one of these kayaking style helmets. And these are pretty widely available now. We had to find them at the kayaking shops. But now companies like Light Monkey market them uh, for uh, for diving. I've always, traditionally, I always had a red one, but uh, got lost and so now I've had to buy a white one in a bit of a hurry. Uh, these sit really nice uh, and snugly right down on your head, even with a hood on. Um, people tend to uh, modify the spider or the harness inside them a little bit, and I find that they do break, and often you'll, you'll see repairs with, with cable tires like this one's got. Um, they're not you know, as comfortable as those nicely padded proper climbing or caving helmets. But for brief uh, sojourns out of the water through the cave, they're, they're fine just to protect your head from scrapes and knocks, uh, although you won't find them as comfortable. Um, you'll notice on this helmet, I have replaced the traditional harness with the clip with just a broad, soft octopus strap from, um, you know, the sort of things you, you tie loads down on the top of your car with a stretchy, stretchy band with hook on either end. Um, I think it was my friend Craig Challen who discovered these wider ones which are really comfortable and um, you just leave a bit of adjustment on the sides, make a couple of slits with a hot hot glue gun, uh, sorry not a hot glue gun, a hot, uh, a, you know, like a rope cutting gun and uh, you can still adjust them a little bit if uh, you need to, um, you know, if you find that uh, you know, you've got an extra th thick hood on or no hood at all, I'll leave a little bit of a, a tail in here so it can be adjusted a little bit. That makes it really quick and easy to put on and off with the um, with the stretchy neck strap there, uh, compared to fiddling around with a uh, you know a snap connection on the side. As soon as I'm wearing gloves, especially dry gloves, I find any other uh, clicking together connections incredibly frustrating. And the last thing you wanted to to be doing is losing your temper just as you're getting ready to uh, to dive. Uh, you can see lots of holes being drilled in this one. Um, the GoPro mount on the side also works really nicely to put a backup light uh, or a paralens camera actually just lying alongside there with a couple of bits of shock cord or bungee uh, to restrain them. Uh, same on the back for a, a battery pack for a primary or not a primary light but a, uh, you know, a, a larger caving light and uh, on the other side another spot for a backup light. So, you know, I use this a lot, and especially when I'm primarily diving and not so much caving as well. My current favorite, uh, actually, for combination of, of diving and caving is this helmet that um, Scuba Pro gave me to test. It's actually a ballistic helmet, I think. Um, Scuba Pro have, have been selling this to, I think, police and military divers, and um, it's a little heavy, but it's got um, really nice 
comfortable padding inside and uh, you know good adjustments in there I've removed some of the the padding and flotation that would have been in there otherwise uh, it sits nicely on my hood and as you can see I've also replaced the the neck strap that with the traditional clip or clasp on the side with one of these wider um, uh, elastic neck uh, straps so chin straps so I'm finding this is actually really nice at the moment it's got these rails on the side which are potentially for putting a, a mast strap in for the military uh, or police divers so that a strap clips into here it goes to the mask and then they can pop the mask up on on top without losing it so I've just removed those and uh, put some bungee in here and it, actually these rails make for a really nice spot to put um, you know lights or power lens cameras and so forth and um, I've got my uh, GoPro mount on the front here which I can use either for a camera or a caving light. Now the other thing I wanted to talk about is the issue of um, mouthpiece retaining straps because that is another significant issue when it comes to the decision of whether you should use a helmet or not. Um, mouthpiece retaining sta straps for those of you who are not for those of you who are not really aware of them uh, are these sort of things. This one's made by Draeger, which was probably the first one around on the market and it's been very widely and extensively used by the military and tested by the military. And the idea is that this hole here will go over the, um, uh, the hard mouthpiece part on your uh, diver, diver's surface valve or BOV bailout valve on your rebreather. And then it's got a built-in mouthpiece attached to it. And the mouthpiece obviously goes in your mouth and this uh, soft rubber flange uh, around it will seal around your mouth and onto your cheeks and in the event that you lose consciousness underwater which as a rebreather diver is you know it's one of the issues that we face from either hyperoxia or hypoxia or hypercapnia then uh, the theory is that having this snugged up really nicely with these adjustable straps uh, this will hold the mouthpiece in your mouth and if you lose consciousness it will prolong the period of time before you drown in otherwise it will in other words it will protect your airway from the ingress of water hopefully whilst you're being rescued by your dive buddies now um, there was a study from the french uh, military french, french naval divers who i think over a series of about 154 loss of consciousness events uh, they suffered only three fatalities um, and they were using a mouthpiece retra retaining strap or gag strap uh, some people call them in those uh, incidents so whilst that is uh, anecdotal evidence in many ways it is a pretty strong argument for the use of one of these straps and it's actually been endorsed by the recent uh, consensus statements in at uh, rebreather forum 4 which i'm proudly wearing my my new t-shirt i've just come back from malta from that very interesting conference so um, you know increasingly the evidence is is that uh, mouthpiece retaining straps might have a significant role in the prevention of drowning in rebreather divers in particular which at the end of the day is the you know the common final pathway for so many uh, accidents to tragically end so you know i'm aware of this evidence but to be honest i've been one of the people who have not embraced the uh, mouthpiece retaining strap or mrs and one of the main reasons is because I often use a helmet and I've been kind of confused about how I could move forward and combine those two issues because sometimes you know in technical diving it's such a highly complex environment we're using very complex bits of equipment and changing one small thing can have unintended or unforeseen consequences and so adding something which appears so simple and easy to use as this actually could find uh, me in in a lot of difficulty when it came time to bail out for example off my rebreather onto either a second rebreather or onto a an open circuit regulator so i thought to share with you the sort of issues that I, i'm facing i would just do a little demonstration to demonstrate or to show how um, you know this adds some complexity to the problem of bailing out or getting even just getting uh, your helmet on, your, your mouthpiece retaining strap and, and the BOV for example in your mouth and, and set you off underway. So what I've done is I've got a different um, mouthpiece retaining strap. Uh, this one's made by Lombardi Undersea and it's quite a nice uh, little unit. It's made from silicon rubber. Uh, it's very easily adjustable. You just pull this tight like a, a mask strap on the side, 
push these little buttons here to, to release the strap when you want to release it and, and take it off and um, it basically combines the MRS um, which comes with a hole in it it doesn't have a built-in uh, mouthpiece like the Draeger one does which to be honest I find a bit wide for my mouth so you can use whatever mouthpiece you prefer on this one. So have a look at Lombardi Undersea. They actually gave us all a free one at RF4, Ribri the 4 and 4. So I thought uh, it's really time to try and address um, the reasons why I haven't been using that. And the uptake's been pretty, pretty poor, apparently. Some surveys have shown that, I can't remember the exact number, but maybe 15 to 20% of rebreather dives at most are using these MRSs. And the, you know, as I say, there's strong suggestion we all should be using them really so I'm determined to give it a try I just need to work out how to do it uh, alongside my my helmet obsession so basically if uh, if this is hanging below my by my face and I have bodged this together so it's entirely possible it could just suddenly fall apart um, and then I'm you know wearing one of my helmets with the elastic uh, which I find so much more preferable in terms of how easy it is to get to get organized We well, can obviously see suddenly There's no way I can get this organized because this strap needs to be on the crown of my head So really I need to have this in my mouth before I put my helmet on now you're obviously going to see an issue if I try and do that So it should really sit right up the top of your head at the high point this will be in my mouth Mm -hmm. so it's just not going to work right so what about if I went back to my traditional strap system um, obviously that is going to be easier so I'll just show you what I mean Okay, that's all fine. But what if I have to bail out suddenly? Close the mouthpiece, let that hang, put a second stage in or Preferably you'd have a bailout valve here, which would make it easier and then you could uh, um, Take some time to sort of get reorganized, but you can just see it's a bit fussy um, The straps are all pushing on my ears. It's not completely comfortable. That might be fine for an hour But if I'm doing a 10 hour dive, I'm not sure if I'm going to be happy with it And at the end of the day, I'm back to this clip up helmet system Which I've got if I've got dry gloves on is going to drive me crazy so these are the reasons I have not yet embraced the mouthpiece retaining strap. I really want to. I think it's the, the safe and the, and the sensible thing to do. I'm just going to work it out. I'm not quite sure if you've got any feedback for me or if you've already solved this dilemma, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. So that's, uh, that's my views on helmets. Um, if you're uh, a GUE diver, I'd love to hear from you guys why uh, you think uh, helmets are the devil's work. If you're a British cave diver, you can tell us, you can explain to people why a uh, helmet is an essential part of your equipment. And to be honest, I kind of lie in the middle. I'll, I'll use them quite often when, when I feel like there's a good uh, reason to. And uh, sometimes I'll, I'll leave it behind if I'm looking for a bit more of a, a bit more simplicity in my diving. Hope you enjoyed this one. Next uh, episode, I'm going to actually move uh, to helmet lights and particularly lights that we can use for both diving and caving. Thanks very much.